Um, we've been uh, in a series called Triggered, and I, I picked that word only because it's wildly popular. And the more that I, you know, it's like one of those things when you become aware of something, really how popular it is, you start seeing it more. So like I see it everywhere now. And I realize more and more how much the word is used. So we use this word so much. Like, hey, you know what? I was triggered. <laughs> you know, I got triggered the other day when you came in the door and you looked at me like that. And it's like I had something in my eye. And I was like, I didn't mean to like offend you. No, it was offensive. And so we, we've been talking about being offended. And we really have to get, and I'm talking now, I'm, I'm going to talk socially and I'm going to talk uh, as a church, our faith, and I'm going to talk personally. Um, this statement I'm about to make applies to all of them. We really do need to come to grips with and try to get a hold of this deep sense of offense that we walk with in life. where we, It's become epidemic, where we walk offended about everything. I'm going to make a very broad stroke statement right now. Everybody seems offended about everything. Like if I say the wrong thing, it's like we are so quick to make judgment calls on where someone's coming from. It's always such a funny conversation. I know that this probably doesn't happen to you. Maybe it does. Uh, I don't know, but whenever I'm in a conversation, this is always this awkward moment, you know, when you're kind of introducing yourself to somebody, and I'm like, oh, yeah, so, um, like, where do you, oh, yeah, I live here, and so I'm like, oh, cool, yeah, like, what brought you here, oh, work, oh, what do you do for work, and oh, you know, I work in, like, the aerospace, you know, or I work in biomed, or I, I work and I do this, or whatever, right, and people are telling you, and there comes this moment right here, here's the moment, you know what they're going to ask me? Well, what do you do? Uh, oh, a bit of a motivational speaker <laughs> of sorts slash comedian <laughs> in and around about segments of faith and helping people improve their life. You know, it's funny, there, now I don't really do that. I just go, oh, I'm a pastor. Usually the conversation ends right there. But as soon as, I use this as an example, as soon, we live in such an offended society, as soon as we say that, I can like see people's eyes, like, you know, some, not all the time, but sometimes. Because there's a preconceived idea of what I carry if I'm a pastor, right? Now, can, can I just be really vulnerable this morning? We're going to get vulnerable. We have so many preconceptions when we walk through life in our society that we walk in in such deep offense that when we meet somebody, we already have a preconceived idea of what their response is going to be to us personally. Now, that could be because of the country I'm from. It could be the color of my skin. It's because maybe, maybe you've already pretty determined who I am. I'm a white American male, so he must vote Republican. He must be a fan of, he must, you know, he probably listens to this music. And we kind of, we, we do this, this thing that seems natural. And what happens is, is that we've walked into place in society, we've walked into this place in church, we've walked into this place personally, where we walk with so much offense about everything, we cease to be able to have real life conversations with each other that we desperately, can I tell you this? We desperately need. I grew up in a, in a little city on the coast called Oceanside. Yeah. Anyone here from Oceanside? Dude, my people. Any pirates in the house? Yeah. Any wildcats? One? That should tell you something. Pirates kill little animals. Just kidding, just kidding, just a joke. Someone's super offended right now. Okay. You get my point about offense. Last week, I talked about five signs, five things, five signs that you might, that five signs that I might, that I, when I see these in my life, that I might be partnering with offense. Now, it's totally different to have offense pass into our sphere of influence. We see an offense. We then can make a choice whether or not we want to pick that offense up and we want to entertain it. We want to partner. We put it in our pockets. We begin walking with it. And now, all of a sudden, it becomes part of our identity. And we're just offended. Every time someone, we're, we're offended. I'm offended. I'm offended. That you, are you offended that I'm offended? You're not offended that I'm offended about this? So I'm offended that you're not offended. You should be offended at the fact that I'm offended about this offense. But don't we see this happen? So there's some signs. We talked about five. Here are the five we talked about last week. 
Sense of entitlement, frustration, control, separation, anger. Those are five things I would highly recommend you go back and listen to the last two weeks if you have no context of what I'm talking about. Now I'm going to bring us up to speed very quickly. We're going to go through five today. And I want you to know these 10 things are not an exhaustive list of things that are signs that we might be partnering with the fence. But I, I'm going to summarize really quickly this, this story of this guy named in 2 Kings. I'm not going to read through it. The last two weeks I read through the whole story. Here's the summary of the story. There's this guy. He's a great warrior. His name is Naaman. He's conquered many things, many places, but he had one deficiency named in Scripture, and this deficiency that was named in Scripture is that he had something called leprosy. So he goes to his king, and his king sends him with a letter to the king of Israel. And so Naaman shows up with, with in today's money, shows up with $5.1 million. It would be the equivalent of showing up with $5.1 million and a letter from the king. And the letter to this king of it, to this king here says, King of Israel, heal my man. He's a great man. He's done a lot for me. Heal my man, Naaman. And the king is like, what the heck do you want me to do? I'm not God. And Elisha, this guy who's a prophet, he hears this. So Elisha steps in. Elisha says, hey, he needs to come down and see me. Elisha, as, as, as uh, Naaman goes down to see him, he takes his entourage down. Chariots and horses is what scripture says. Because when you're a great person, you have an entourage. So he takes all his people. Don't you have people? I have people. I have too many people. Seven kids, 10 people in my house. I need, I need a bigger house. Like, Lord, please. I, right? I got people. And sometimes having that many people gives me a sense of entitlement that I deserve something. And that's what Naaman was, well, you know what? I need, you know, I, I, I'm going to go and see Elisha. And Elisha doesn't even come out of the house. The way the story goes, Elisha says to his servant, hey, I want you to go out and I want you to talk to this guy and tell him this. So the servant goes out of the house, doesn't even go, Elisha doesn't himself, doesn't even go out to talk to this great man who's come with an entourage and over $5.1 million. How many of you would make that decision? Naaman gets super offended. Servant tells him, you need to go wash in the Jordan River. He gets angry. Ultimately, he ends up wisely listening to his servants and he goes and he washes in the river and he's completely healed. One of the things that I think that I run into in life that Naaman ran into that could be a sign that you're partnering with a fence is, is this issue of respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Give it to me, give it to me. Naaman felt disrespected. Now I want to tell you, men sitting in the room, there was a social science study done. Men, I want you to understand this. You are hardwired to want respect. This is, I mean, and this isn't like clear 100% across the board in terms of between men and women, but by and large, the social science study that was done said this. When men were asked, would you rather be respected and feel unloved or feel loved but be disrespected. Guess what men said? I would rather be respected and feel unloved. Almost across the board, every man said that. There's something in men. Like when we feel disrespected, I think that's why when men, when we get together, there's conflicts between the testosterone. It's when it's, and there's certain things that men, you know what I'm talking about. There's certain things that we can do with one another that are like little, like, like it's a little disrespect and our wives are like, you're stupid. Why? That's so, that's so dumb. You know, and men are just like, you have no, did you, did you see what? And, it's, and, gir and girls, you're totally oblivious. You're like, I don't even know. I just feel so loved. Because when they asked the females, guess what they said? They said, I'd rather feel loved and disrespected. This is the wiring of men and women. So respect is a big issue. Respect, it's built into us. But what happens is that if we don't understand respect, we sometimes will end up feeling disrespected and not know why, and we will respond out of it and we'll get ourselves into trouble. I've done this a ton in my life. I'm going to read this really quickly, 1 Thessalonians 4.9. Now about your love for one another, we don't need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Hold on a second, I'm dancing to someone's phone. 
Okay. If you're watching online, you don't know why I'm doing that. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. Now, what I'm about to read is like one of my favorite passages in all scripture, and you're going you're gonna to hear why. This is, this is great. Okay. We urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. To do what? To love the people. You've been loving the people in Macedonia. You've been loving the people in San Diego really well. You've been loving the people in Vista really well. You've been loving the people in Oceanside really well. You've been loving the people in Carlsbad, the people in Escondido, the people in San Mar people in Poway, the people in Rancho Bernardo. You've been loving the people around you really, really well. And we're going to encourage you to do that more and more. This is what the scripture is saying. We don't want you to stop where you're at. You've been doing a great job, but I want you to do it more and more. And now listen. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. I love this advice. You should mind your own business. I could preach right there for a while. Okay? You should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect so that your life may win the respect of outsiders, so that you will not be dependent on anybody. What is respect? When I looked it up, respect means reverence. Reverence is a gesture of respect as if to bow. So when you come into the, when you come into the courtship of a king or a queen, what do you do? You show respect. How do you show respect? Because by being reverent. How, how, how are you being reverent? Well, when I walk into the courtship of a king or queen, that I would be expected to what? To bow. That's, show, that's showing that respect. It's a state of being revered. To be revered is to be shown great honor. Here's the problem. Naaman didn't feel like he was being shown any great honor, but he was a great man. See, what happens is with my pride, when I feel like I'm a great man, I deserve great honor. So when I walk into my house and there's certain things my family knows, there's certain things that, like, I'm going to use this word, certain things that trigger me, certain things that trigger, and my, and my, my kids, my wife, they know there's certain things because it's, it's things in my past, things that I grew up, things that I don't like, and I walk in and they trigger, and what happens, I actually take that as a sign of dishonor. But I'm not partnering with the fact that the dishes aren't done. I'm going to be vulnerable because that's one of my triggers. Now, I could tell you the backstory as to why. I won't. But there, there's a story attached. To it. Don't we all have stories attached to our offenses? I understand there's a story attached to the offense. I don't think our heart should be attached to it. And I feel dishonored, disrespected. And I feel like I haven't been, this is the pride, I feel like I haven't been bowed to the way that, life has not bowed to you the way that you think it should, and so you're offended. You feel disrespected. I feel disrespected. Offense is really what's below the surface. And I might be partnering with offense if I'm actually walking around disrespected. And I learned this, I learned this from my father-in-law, uh, who you know, passed away just a handful of months ago, retired Marine, went on to have another career selling life insurance, went on to have another part-time fun work that he did, um, working with people at the local mortuaries who just lost their families. This guy just, he, this is just who he was. Just there for people. This guy commanded respect. Do you notice that I did not say he demanded it? Respect is not something you can demand. It can only be commanded. He commanded respect because he walked into the room. He would always get on me because I wasn't the best dressed in the room. Because he was taught to be the best dressed. He'd always, he, he, he would sit and tease me. You know, my, my father, if you didn't meet him, is just old school African American. He's like, Pat! Grew up in the South. Him and I are like polar opposites. Like really. <laughs> All you preachers! Up in the pulpit. <laughs> Walk around preaching in them blue jeans. Now why was he saying this to me? Because this guy, everyone knew Mr. Coleman in Oceanside. So many people know this family, right? Here's what blows my mind. He'd walk in, he'd be the best dressed. He'd be, if you ever saw him here, he had a fedora on, bam. Car always detailed, suit. Like, where are you going? He's like, to the grocery store. 
I'm being, I'm kind of being facetious, but he would get on me. You need to be the best dressed. Why? Because he learned, this is what commands, he'd walk in and you just knew that man is a respectable person. You don't have to demand respect when you're respectable. It says here that respect was one, which means it's not something that you're handed. It's not, it's not like, oh, you have your respect license, right? You earn it. So I'm going to get up every morning and I'm actually going to earn respect. Am I, am I being respectable? And I used to tease my father-in-law. So when he got done kind of jawing with me about my blue jeans, I was sitting in a chair in his house. And, he's, and he kind of like looked at me and like rolled his eyes. And I said, uh, Daddy, we affectionately called him Daddy. I said, Daddy, um, that's not, that's actually not accurate because I don't wear blue jeans, they're black. <laughs> he had a soft spot for me. I believe it. Just let, let me believe it. That, that, that. Number two, you might be partnering with a fence if gossip is present. Ooh, this is going to be a big one. This, I, I love this passage, James 1.26. Those who consider themselves religious. Okay, what is religious? Religious is like, I have a routine where I get up, I go to church on Sundays, I pray to Jesus, I read my Bible, I watch online, and I do these certain things, like people of faith. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. You know what this tells me? Gossip can undo all of the things that you're trying to do. You can do everything you can with your hands. You can, you can mind your own business. You can work with your hands. You can love people around you more and more. And in one fell swoop with your tongue, you can undo it all. People are listening. People are, pe people are waiting. They're hearing. Oh, you're a pastor. You know, when I tell people, oh, I'm a pastor, you, they're, they're listening for what I say next. They're listening for me to join in maybe on the complaint train. They're listening for me. Cause why? Because they, cause, and I'm going to tell you something. As soon as, I, as, soon as my mouth, and, I, and I, lose, I lose control of my tongue, my tongue, your tongue and my tongue have the ability to set fires. An offense always searches for a partner. When I'm offended, I want to be with, I want to be with other people that are offended like me. And gossip is the gatherer of all of the offenders that are offended and carry the offenses. Gossip says things like this. Here's some language for gossip. And, I, and, and these are born out of people, like, ask, people will ask me questions. Hey, is this considered gossip? Or I've heard this through years of counseling, or I've honestly said it myself. Gossip says things like, hey, uh, can I talk to you? Can you believe what happened to me? And I want to bring you into the know about the thing that I'm carrying, the offense that I'm carrying. And by the way, if I ask that question and you're not willing to, you've now offended me. And you're the next person that I'm going to gossip about. That's how it works. Here's something else gossip says. Um, I, I'm just venting here. Or how about this one? You know, I'm, I'm an external processor. Can I, can I process this with you? How about this one? I'm really seeking counsel and advice on this subject with everyone. And all of Facebook. And really whoever will listen in the checkout line at Sprouts. Or the Walmarts. Yes, you have to put an S on the end of Walmart. It is Walmart's. 
what's happening? What's happening is, is that offense doesn't like living alone. Because I said this week one, the power and the, and the purpose of offense is to destroy. So offense doesn't want to just destroy my heart. It wants me to go and gather through gossip. Because if I can gossip to all of you and gather all of you to my same offense, now I have you underneath the burden of what I was offended by. Now it's destroying all of you as it's destroying me. Isn't that fascinating how this works? And that's gossip's job. I would ask, Where's your first conversation if you're needing to vent? Where's your first conversation if you need to process externally? Where's your first conversation happening when you're saying, gosh, I don't know, I think this person did me wrong. I think this organization did me wrong. I think this company who I called and I waited for 25 minutes to talk to somebody who doesn't even sound like they live in the United States and when they didn't handle things for me, I felt disrespected and I asked for a manager And then after five minutes, the phone hung up on me. Not that any of this has ever happened to me. Did you know that when I get onto Facebook or I call and I start telling all my friends how much that company X and blah, 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 you know, I'm just gossiping. Did you know that? I'm sowing seeds of that in my own heart. But they deserve it. God should be the first place that we process. Proverbs 10, 19, sin is not ended by multiplying words. This is a fabulous scripture. Sin is not ended by multiplying words. Do you know what that means? When you feel like someone has wronged you and you feel like you need to just say a bunch of words to overcome that sin, that's not how it works. The sin isn't ended by multiplying words. In fact, I want to tell you That when I begin multiplying words over something that's offended me, I'm now just sinning. Why? Because sin will want to reproduce itself. It says the prudent hold their tongues. The end of that scripture. But the prudent hold their tongues. I need to process with God first. I don't need to process with my wife sometimes first. This This is crazy to think. There are things that people will talk to me about that my, my wife and I do not speak to one another about. And there, there is often times that my wife will sit down, let's say it's a couple, will sit down with the wife and she'll go, well, your husband probably already told you what was going on. And my wife will say to them politely, and unless my husband asks you guys if he could speak to me, my husband has not said anything to me about what's going on. Why? Because that, that's gossip. Do you know what I need to do? Mind my own business. I need to stop. Like, you're multiplying words. It's like, that, 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 that. But you don't understand. Blah, 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 blah. But you just need, you just. Criticism, number three, you might be partnering with offense if you find yourself being critical. This guy, Naaman, got really critical. He was really angry about how he got handled. He got really critical. In fact, he got so critical, he started making a big deal over what river he needed to wash in. Aren't these rivers in Damascus better than the Jordan River? It's, you know, it's, and he starts getting critical over these things. I might be partnering with offense if I find myself, I'm going to use this term, walking with a critical spirit. Criticism. Let, let, me, let me define criticism really quick. Expressing adverse or disapproving comments or judgments. Condemning. It means condemning or judgmental. This is important to hold on to. It means condemning or judgmental. Now, I want to tell you, we make judgment calls every day. In fact, before you got here this morning, you probably made a thousand judgment calls. What you were going to wear how you were going to respond to the person sitting next to you when you felt like they needed a slap upside the head maybe. What you were going to eat. The different routes you were going to take here. Whether or not you should run that red light. Whether or not you should be nice to the person who wasn't driving very nice in front of you. Whether or not you were even going to come to church. You're making a judgment call right now. Does this guy, is this guy an idiot? Should I listen to a word he's saying? Do I believe what he's saying? 
Am I offended by what he's saying? Are you being critical of me right now? You may be offended. A critical spirit, here's an easy way to know it. A critical spirit always builds itself up by tearing other people down. Have you ever been around somebody that you go and you start talking to them and no matter what they, no matter, it's a, we would say they're negative people. Everything they have to say is negative. Hey, how is like, I, you know, we, we try to hang out as much as we can as a family. There's a lot of us, so it's hard to get all of us in one place. So it's like, hey, how was such and such? You know, we went to Disneyland the other day and it was like, how was Disneyland? It's like, you know, someone in the family is like, oh, you know, it's like kind of crowded and the traffic was uh, just critical. Like, it's like, bro, are you, you at, you live in Southern California. It looks like this most of the year and you got to go to Disneyland and you're telling me, right, yeah, you know, that ride was closed. I had to wait 50 minutes on that other ride. 50 minutes. Can you believe that? Someone's always got to be complaining, right? Criticism always comes out as a complaint. You ever met anybody like that? Are you like that? If you haven't met someone like that, you may be that person. <laughs> I'm not judging you. Okay, I'm just I'm just saying. Don't judge, Matthew 7 1 says, or you will be judged. In the same way that you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The most critical people often are met with the most criticism. You will reap what you what goes around. Number four, feedback triggers you to fight back. How many of you love feedback? Awesome, that's honest, like four of you. Can I tell you, can, can I tell you this is almost proof that we all walk around with a ton of offense. You watch how this happens. Watch how this pyramid falls. The reason why most of us don't actually like feedback is we perceive it as criticism. Why do we perceive it as criticism? Because we probably are partnering with offense in our heart so every time someone offers us feedback, we take it as them being critical. I'm not a fan of feedback. It's hard for me. Do you know who I'm the most critical on? Myself. And so feedback for me, and again, I'm just being vulnerable, feedback for me has been tough. And so if I don't even like giving myself feedback. Like write a paper, read the paper back, analyze the paper, give a sermon, watch the sermon back, analyze the sermon. I'm like, no, thank you. It's all judgmental to me. Why? Because in my life, there's been this partnership with offense. And I end up walking in a way that every time someone tries to offer some piece of advice to me, I want to push it away because I feel like they're being critical. God's had to work on that in my heart. Here's, here's the definition. Feedback is information about reactions to a product, a person's performance of a task, etc., which is used as a basis for improvement. Now, here, here, here's what we need to know. It's used for a basis for improvement. Criticism is used to do what? Tear the person down. So when Someone comes to you and offers you feedback. You have to stop and ask yourself, is this person offering this information to me, trying to help me improve or to make me work? Are they trying to make themselves seem better? Or are they doing this to really help me? It says in Proverbs 12, 15, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. You know, Naaman made a lot of mistakes in this story. Go back and read it. It's a fascinating story. Naaman made a lot of mistakes in this story, but one thing he got right, right at the end, guess what he got right? Feedback. And feedback, feedback flows upstream and downstream. This is what I mean. Naaman 
had his servants come to him and give him feedback about his response. So feedback is not, well, I need someone who I perceive better than me. Ah, arrogant, pride. I get a ton of feedback from my children. The other night I'm standing in the kitchen and I'm, you know, here's my excuses. I had low blood sugar. I had a hard workout that day. I was at work. I had missed some meals and I walked in and there's these triggers. And at some point, my wife with my five-month-old daughter, Nohea, and a handful of my other daughters are in the living room. And they all, at one point, and I'm like, rawr, 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 grumbling, rawr, being critical, rawr, I feel disrespected, rawr, you know. And I stop, and it's dead quiet. No one's responding. And I'm like, I feel disrespected. No one's responding. This is what was going on. You guys, you ever did like, Okay, so I stop and I'm just like, why aren't they responding? This is me talking to myself. And I turn and they're all looking at me like, <laughs> their feedback for me, they just flat out, and they couldn't help, they just started laughing. One of my daughters seriously is like, oh, damn, I'm not offended. <laughs> I'm a pastor at a church. <laughs> Oh, I'm talking about being offended right now. And look at me. You know, and she starts making fun of me. And, there's a, and I was like, and I just, this is my, such a childish response. But this is what I did. She was giving me feedback and I went. Because at 46, and a dad, that was the most mature thing that I could do. <laughs> and I turned around and I walked back in the kitchen. And my, they're just like, leave me like, dude, you're an idiot. But in a weird way, it, that feedback loop, it, it, it like arrested my heart. Mostly the part about like, oh, you're a pastor. You're supposed to be preaching on there. And I'm just like, yeah. She had me right there. And this, this specific daughter of mine has a way with me with things like that. She just goes, boom, right to the heart. Ever since she was little. One time, she said to me, here's feedback for you. I'm mad. We we're living in Oceanside still, and, I'm, and I'm, we only had four kids. And I'm just so upset about something. And she's two. I won't say which one it was. She, she, was, she was probably three years old. She looks at me. And I, I look down at her, and I'm in the middle of, you know, just, I'm offended. She goes, why are you so mean? Like all of the, like my blood pressure immediately just went and dropped. And I was like, Ugh. are you willing to receive feedback from supervisors or servants? Because it could come from both. But it's not criticism. People aren't really that critical about you. There are people in your life that want you to, they want you to experience great joy in your life and want you to grow. Something that I know about Naaman is, um, if he would not have listened to feedback, he would have missed his healing. How many things are you and I missing in life at the end of the story because I'm not willing to be humble and listen to feedback? How many things have I missed in life because I wasn't willing to listen to feedback? How many things today am I not listening to currently that, that God is saying, I'm trying to bring some people or some things around, you know, hey, knucklehead, if you stop doing that thing, life's going to be better. No. A hammer to the head, self-inflicted, is amazing. And all of these things really aim, all these symptoms serve one pur purpose, and they aim to do one thing. We do these things to try to protect ourselves, to defend ourselves, to defend our position. 
And what's sad is some of us do these things to actually protect and defend. We build a hedge of protection around our, off our offenses so that we don't have to let go. We don't want to let go of our offenses. But the goal is we become defensive. And I will tell you, the, the last one for today is defensiveness. You ever say something to somebody and you're like, why? And they just get defensive. And you look at them and you're like, why are you so defensive? They're trying to protect something. Here's the problem. Did Naaman heal himself? Did Naaman heal himself? Who is his healer? God. Did Naaman have to participate with God in his healing? Yeah. Are you participating with God in your healing? Are you getting defensive? God is your defender. You are not your defender. We just sang this song. It's so much better your way. You're a defender and it's so much better your way. I've tried to defend myself for a lifetime and I'm telling you it doesn't work out quite the way that I've ever wanted it. God is a way better defender of me. Let's stand. The problem, the problem is we partner with offenses and we, and we ultimately, we get defensive and it comes out with all these symptoms. The problem is that offense always seeks to defend, but God's purpose is to restore. Naaman was trying to defend himself. And the whole time, through the whole story, God is trying to actually restore Naaman. And so what happens is I get really defensive over things and I run around and I'm going to be, I'm offended and I'm going to defend myself and protect myself. Defend, I need to defend me. And God's like, if you would stop flailing around and just listen for a second, I'm going to restore that thing in you that's been lost. I'm going to restore that thing in you you've been struggling with. I want to restore, I want to redeem what the world says is not redeemable in you. God is a redeemer. You know what that means? He can take scaly, dry, diseased skin and he can restore and redeem the very skin. He can make new. He can do a new thing. Some of us are a step away. Some of us are, are right there in this offense, this thing where we're, 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 we're trying to defend and protect ourselves. And God's like, would you let me, would you let me be your redeemer? Would you let me be your restoration? Would you let me today be your healer? Would you let me today do it my way? Would you be willing today for me to enter into the situation and you think that you got to go bathe in that river and you got to go buy that house and you got to go live in that state and you have to make this amount of money and you got to date this person and you got to look this way and get this many likes on your Instagram post. You got to be this popular. You got to eat like this. You have to have a body image that looks a certain way. There's so many things that God is trying to arrest our attention and say, would you let me for one second? be your healer. Can I please restore in you the things that have been lost? You were never purposed for the things that you're walking in. This is what God's saying to you. You were never purposed to walk in the things you're walking in, but I can redeem them. That has been my purpose as God from the very beginning. That's what he's saying to you this morning. From the very beginning, my purpose was to always redeem and restore. And I want to walk around and defend. So we've purposed as a ministry, I'm going to tell you this right now, we've purposed as a ministry, this has become one of our values. Where we just say, hey, at, at the movement, we're going to walk unoffended. We are going to determine to walk unoffended. Because God is our defender. Are you partnering potentially with offense? Do you see any of these signs in your life? Next week, if you think it's okay to have a little bit of poison, just a little bit of Thanksgiving's coming up. If I told you, hey, there's a little bit of poison in your pie. I'm 
Not a lot, just a little. How many of you would be like, I want to eat it. Why do we do that with our heart then? Are you willing to have a little bit of poison in your heart? And next week, we're going to talk about the destructive nature of these things. To that, now we've seen symptoms. Now let's talk about what really is happening and, and, and the payoff for partnering with offense, which isn't, it's not healthy, it's not good. Let's pray. Lord, today, this morning, if there's anybody here who is struggling, and I said this the last two weeks, if you're struggling with offense, You've been offended in life. And sometimes offenses are deep. Let me say this. If you're struggling because you feel that you have offended somebody deeply, we would love to pray with you. Not gossip with you. We would love to pray for you. We would love for you to have the freedom and to be able to walk in the joy of that freedom. To be able to walk in in a way that you no longer are hinged to these things. We would love to pray for you. Please don't leave here this morning without coming down to the front. We have a ministry team that would love to pray for you for the rest of us. If you feel comfortable doing so. If today, if you're like, I want, to, I want to be able to walk with God as my defender, you can just open your hands up like you're going to receive something. It's Christmas morning. And you're going to receive this gift. God, I'm going to ask today that you continue to bestow on us the knowledge that you're a defender, perfect defender. You are a perfect defender. In Psalms, it says that when you're our defender, that it is impossible that we're defeated. God, I know in my life I've proven that as my own defender, I, I am more than able to be defeated. But this morning, God, with willing hearts and hands, we say, God, be our defender. Thank you for going before us, Jesus. Thank you for being to our side. Thank you for being behind us. Thank you for being above us. Thank you for being below us. Thank you for taking all of the different areas that the enemy could come at us and standing and being our defender. We thank you. In Jesus' powerful name, everyone said,